Everybody, welcome to the Washington Institute Policy Forum. I am Dr. David Pollack, Senior Fellow, Bernstein Fellow here at the Washington Institute, and I'm delighted to be the host and moderator for today's session with Dr. Elham Ahmed from the Syrian Democratic Council, who is visiting Washington, D.C., and has agreed to join us for this hour to make some remarks and to take your questions. I'm delighted to report that I've been told we have around 160 participants. Um, it's a very nice number, and I hope that what we say here today will find an interested audience because the subject deserves great attention, urgent attention even. Let me just start by saying two things about the technical aspects of today's session. Number one, you can pick your language on your screen, um, it, either English or Arabic. We have an excellent simultaneous translator who will be doing both languages and you can listen and ask questions in either language. That brings me to the question function. You are welcome to submit your questions through the function that you see, and I will be selecting questions for a response in the second half of today's hour. So now it's my great pleasure and privilege to introduce Dr. Elham Ahmed, the chair of the executive committee of the Syrian Democratic Council from the Autonomous Administration of Northeast Syria. I have known Dr. Ahmed at least virtually <laughs> for a number of years. I was also privileged to host her here at the Washington Institute in person for a round table a few years ago. And today we are facing a situation in her homeland that requires some serious thought by all the players involved, including the United States. And I'd be very interested to hear from Dr. Ahmed your views about the situation in Northeast Syria, in Syria as a whole, in the region as a whole, and what your views are about American policy on all of these issues today. Without further ado then, Dr. Elham Ahmed, of the Syrian Democratic Council. The floor is yours, please. Can you please just unmute, 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 right. Okay, let's try that again, please. شكراً شكراً دي بالتحياتي للجميع لكل الحضور وأنا سعيدة باللقاء بكم مرة أخرى ولو أنه افتراضياً لكني بواشنطن أتيت من سوريا قبل عدة أيام لعقد لقاءات هنا ونقل الصورة الموجودة لدينا في شمال وشرق سوريا وفي سوريا إلى العالم الأمريكي والرأي العام الأمريكي طبعا بخصوص الملف السوري باعتبار نحن من مكونات شمال وشرق سوريا أو من مكونات الشعب السوري عانينا من موضوع الاستبداد السوري النظام السوري وعانينا من الإرهاب. سقوطك سوريا الرجيم. We have also suffered from terrorism and the hostilities in the region from the regional countries. Today in this region, we are in a very important stage, which is the governance and the political solution. And the conflict in Syria is being frozen now, and we see that there is an international consensus to freeze the conflict in Syria. And this is very important to freeze the conflict, but the freezing of the conflict should move towards a final political solution. And therefore, what we currently see the freezing of the Geneva process and the constitutional process, these processes have reached a dead end. 
and we see that it is very important to open different channels, which is the direct dialogue inside Syria with the forces uh, that are influential in Syria. And therefore, we see that it is important to have direct dialogue and discussions inside Syria within a political process. And this political process has to be under the framework of decentralization in Syria. And therefore, what we raise to the United States is to support us in this respect, in this path, and to play the role of the guarantor of the political process, direct talks with the government in Syria. This is a very important point. We are working on it and we are trying to convey uh, this uh, view to the US administration here. In addition to that, there are administrative uh, things, uh, the governance uh, in the region. The model that we have created so far is the best model that we can apply. Uh, it is decentralization and uh, we have political decentralization, cultural uh, decentralization. There is diversity, there is uh, gender equality, and there is the economic development that we are pursuing currently. So in this respect, the governance that was created in north and east of Syria, we want it to be a model for Syria, all of it. So if we want to have a political solution with the current administration, we see that it should be within the framework of a decentralized Syria. And there should be a kind of rights and responsibilities towards the different factions and the diverse groups inside Syria. And therefore, the issue of governance is important. We currently have some challenges concerning this administration we face some challenges. Uh, still, ISIS, uh, the Islamic State, is still there. And uh, they are trying to seize an opportunity to reorganize and to resurface and to uh, threaten the global and regional security and even uh, security, of course, inside Syria. And therefore, the partnership that we had, which is still existing between us and the United States, is a very strong partnership. And we see that it is necessary to continue this partnership and we need to strengthen it even more. And in order to strengthen this partnership, we believe that it is uh, critical to have more support from the US administration. There should be stronger support to the autonomous administration and there should be contributions in the rehabilitation of the infrastructure in the area in terms of uh, utilities and services. ISIS prospers and flourishes in poor uh, communities. Uh, when people are unemployed, ISIS takes advantage of them and uh, recruits uh, people, uh, poor people, and therefore we have to dry out the tourism sources from the ideological perspective and from the service delivery perspective. So this point uh, needs to be uh, pondered and uh, focused on. Add to that the economic situation in the area, there is a blockade uh, and uh, the area is under blockade. There are no crossings that are open and our relations with the regime are uh, still tense and the regime is uh, pressuring us and closing the crossings uh, with the rest of Syria. And sometimes the tensions are up to the level of arresting people based on their identities. Uh, so Kurdish people are arrested by identity or detained by identity. So we have this level of tensions sometimes between us and the regime. But uh, we still believe that all these issues should be resolved and the area should be supported in terms of economy. Uh, we need companies to come to the region and to operate officially and if the area is declared to be exempted from the US sanctions, I believe this will be very useful and uh, the United States uh, will have a more positive role in this area and this will contribute to developing a full-fledged political solution. So we believe that the economic challenge 
is critical, it's very important. We need to address it. And the political challenge as well, we need to address it through a direct uh, dialogue or direct talks. Add to that, there is regional uh, challenge. Uh, there is uh, Turkish hostility against the Kurds and their cause. This is something that needs to be addressed. So far, Turkey used the card of terrorism against us and tried to eliminate the Kurdish presence. Turkey is launching military campaigns inside and outside Syria under the pretext of counter-terrorism. But in fact, Turkey is trying to eliminate the Kurdish presence completely. And therefore, the United States can play a role in eliminating this phobia with the Turkish authorities by having a peace process between Kurds and Turkey. And we are ready actually to launch dialogue. We are ready to enter into any negotiations or talks with Turkey in order to resolve these issues. A final point that I want to raise after the US withdrawal from Afghanistan, there uh, is discussion currently about uh, will the United States withdraw from north and east of Syria. And they want to indicate here that Syria is not like Afghanistan. Syria is different. Uh, and the US presence in Syria, in north and east of Syria, it is a symbolic presence. Despite uh, the very small number of troops that we have, the, but the United States is very effective and it has a role in creating a balance between different forces in Syria. And the United States uh, can strike a balance uh, in terms of the situation in Syria because there is symbolic significance uh, for the United States. And uh, based on the meetings that we have conducted here with the officials from the US administration, we did not hear anything from them concerning withdrawal. So withdrawal from Syria is not on the table of the US administration. This is what we have noticed. And this was communicated to us directly. So we hope that uh, other factors in the coming days do not influence this US position. We see that the US presence in Syria is uh, contributing, is a contributing factor to ensure a political solution in Syria. In addition, there should be more support to this area. We see that this is very important and it should continue. In brief, uh, these are the points that I wanted to raise and I'm waiting for your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed for that presentation you raised a lot of issues even as you covered a lot of issues and we'll be talking about that in uh, a few minutes with our audience before we do that i would like to turn the floor over for some comments by a good friend and colleague and an expert on syria with government experience recently here in the administration and extensive experience in and around all Syrian issues, and that's Andrew Tabler. Andrew, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, David. Um, greetings uh, from Austin, Texas, and uh, it's great to share the screen with uh, Elham Ahmed this morning uh, and, and uh, just a few remarks. Uh, because I think most of you logged on to hear Ilham and not me, uh, but or perhaps David as well. Um, so just, just a couple of ideas that come out of um, Ilham's comments. First of all, um, uh, to point out that the, uh, the SDC has served as the backbone of our, um, of our efforts in Northeast Syria to, to make sure that ISIS is not only defeated, but stays defeated. Uh, and has been a valiant uh, effort uh, uh, ally in the field, um, has put forward extensive efforts um, uh, like uh, many in the military uh, have have never seen elsewhere. Uh, and so my hat is off to uh, is off to you in that regard. I, I fully understand the challenges of governance. Um, I think it's a couple, it's it's um, multifaceted. Um, if not for uh, there 
the biggest reason being that the areas um, in the MERV, uh, in the Middle Euphrates River Valley, uh, are diverse, uh, in, are made up of multiple tribes uh, that, uh, that are, are, are hard to, uh, to, to get to work together during the best of times. And uh, your efforts until now have been, have been exemplary. I think there's also the challenge uh, that you faced when uh, during the Trump administration, uh, and that was uh, when I was in government, uh, when the US forces pulled partially back uh, from their positions. Um, and um, many at that time were um, saying that the Eastern part of Syria was going to fall and uh, that uh, defeat uh, was inevitable and the regime's advance was inevitable and as was the Russians. It turned out to be uh, premature uh, at best. And I, I think um, the situation is much more complicated um, than that. I would point out to Ilham's comments concerning um, support for the autonomous administration, but support particularly for um, the uh, for the stabilization in that area. Uh, I know during the Trump administration, we struggled with that, um, uh, not just in terms of US funding, but also trying to make it more sustainable um, for you uh, going forward uh, as you uh, engage in a political process. Uh, we felt that for you to have a, a more sustainable and independent form, uh, form of um, revenues would, uh, would strengthen your negotiating power and the regime's uh, um, foot dragging uh, on these efforts has been noteworthy. Um, so, um, and also you, as you pointed out rightly, have been under a blockade. Uh, the administration, the Biden administration in their recent negotiations with the Russians um, over the cross-border uh, mechanism and the vote at the UN uh, attempted to uh, reestablish uh, three crossings from the current one um, including Yarobia crossing, which would have supported the areas in Northeast Syria. Unfortunately, that was not uh, successful. Um, also, what has not been successful until now, a big, big question marks in terms of, um, especially with the, the recent comments that we're going to be staying in Northeast Syria or not withdrawing, as you've mentioned, I've heard those as well. And that concerns uh, the questions over the recent uh, energy contracts, particularly uh, the administration's um, uh, non-renewal of a license for an American company, Delta Crescent Energy, to operate in Northeast Syria, which was intended to help your organization uh, um, be able to sustain itself going forward and to negotiate uh, through strength uh, as part of the political process. So lots of questions in that regard. I'd like to get that in the questions and answers, um, but I'm not, gonna get, uh, I'm not gonna get ahead of myself uh, I do agree with um, uh, those that say that the, uh, the way that the U.S. Uh, withdrawal from Northeast, uh, sorry, from Afghanistan, the way that that took place, the all fall down, sudden collapse, so to speak, uh, of the Afghan government uh, shows that a sloppy, uh, uh, ill-planned, uh, withdrawal is not in America's interest, nor is it in the interests of our allies who are fighting extremism. Uh, so that puts a double uh, effort, uh, not only in supporting allies, but in supporting a, a bona fide political process uh, to end the war. Um, I would point out that the, as much as the war has been frozen, unfortunately, the Geneva process has been frozen as well. And uh, we're going to need a lot more effort to try and get um, uh, agreements across Syria concluded that will lead to a viable solution so that we can end uh, this war uh, on, on sustainable means and, uh, and, and keep the extremists at bay. And we still have a lot of work to do. So without, uh, without further comment, I'll hand it over to David. Great, thank you very much, Andrew, for those important comments. And also, again, for the questions that you raise. And what I would like to do in very brief remarks is to address uh, what in some sense is an important factor in this equation that uh, has not been mentioned, I think, or hardly mentioned so far, and that's Turkey and Turkish policy and how that impacts on the SDF, 
and on the people of Northeast Syria, of Syria as a whole, in fact, and on American policy toward all of those questions. We've already got a few questions from our audience about that, but let me, in my own remarks, uh, before I get to those questions from all of you, just mention a recent fact of only five or six years ago that I think has great bearing on the overall issue of Turkish policy in Syria. Until the fall of 2015, the Turkish government, the same government that runs Turkey today, the government of Mr. Erdogan and the AK Party, actually was cooperating with the Syrian Kurds across the border. The, what was then the YPG and soon to become the SDF, the Syrian Democratic Forces, and the political leadership of the Kurdish political party, the PYD, that's one of the constituent elements of the administration that you, Dr. Ahmed, run in Syria, in Northeast Syria. The government in Ankara cooperated politically, diplomatically, even militarily with those Kurdish-led elements of Northeast Syria across the Turkish border. And that raises the question whether or not it might be possible in the future, despite the last five or six years of great tension and even armed clashes and invasion and occupation by Turkish forces into Northern Syria, whether in the future you can imagine a new situation in which some kind of reconciliation or at least coexistence on agreed terms between your administration, the Syrian Democratic Council and Turkey can again take place. Perhaps with American mediation and support, perhaps even with Russian or other mediation and support. This, it seems to me, is crucial to the future of Northeast Syria and of the Kurds in Syria and of the Syrian Democratic Council that you lead and in fact of Syria as a whole. And it's a crucial issue, of course, for the United States, which has tried with great uh, pains and with only mixed success to reconcile our support for the Syrian Democratic Council on the one hand and our NATO alliance with a very important partner in Turkey on the other hand. So I want to ask you, and this will be perhaps our first question in the Q&A session, I want to ask you how you see, Dr. Ahmed, the possibilities of relations with Turkey in the future and how you see the impact that this issue has on your own internal political debates and on your relations with the US government, please. Thank you. We uh, do not have uh, any animosity against Turkey, but uh, Turkey is the party that has uh, hysterical animosity with the Kurdish people. And uh, in fact, we see that the racist uh, policies of the Turkish state uh, or this uh, Turkish government uh, is detrimental to Turkey and the Kurdish people. Currently, Turkey is occupying our lands and areas. Turkey crossed the border, actually, and invaded Syrian territories uh, and uh, colonized swathes of the Syrian territory, uh, and they have displaced the people of Afrin and uh, Tel Abyad and other parts of Syria. And these are 
contentious uh, points between us. If we want to have a dialogue with them, uh, uh, these files should be addressed, uh, and or the dialogue should guarantee finding solutions for these issues. We are not looking forward to having wars with Turkey nor with any other neighbor country. We want dialogue and we want to resolve all the uh, pending issues uh, through the peaceful means. And if Turkey is open to this approach or these peaceful means, we are ready for that, absolutely. But Turkey currently is attacking the Kurdish uh, people and is targeting them. You know, in Turkey, uh, there are detentions, uh, apprehensions uh, for the Kurds. Uh, elected uh, Kurdish uh, people are in the presence of Turkey and inside Iraq. Uh, Iraq, uh, the uh, Kurdistan region is uh, being, or province is being threatened by the Turkish fighters. If uh, Turkey, if Turkey tries to have discussions with the uh, YPG and uh, PKK, I believe uh, that uh, things will improve and North uh, Iraq will be safe and North and East Syria will be safe. And therefore we see that it is critical for Turkey to develop a dialogue within Turkey itself, inside Turkey, with the Kurds there. And we in North and East of Syria, we are ready actually, and we are open to have dialogue with Turkey to resolve all the pending issues. And on the basis of uh, having the people return to their homes and uh, all the displaced people should go back to their uh, properties and should uh, regain their properties because they were stripped of their properties. Okay, thank you very much for that uh, response. That's, I think, uh, covers a lot of the ground and is an important contribution to this discussion. Now I'm going to turn to questions from the audience. And Andrew, if there's something that you want to say in response to any of these questions, please do feel free to chime in, as well as you, Dr. Ahmed. One question relates to, uh, and this is uh, all the way from Lebanon, from Dr. Osman Bakhash, uh, who sent this question in. It relates to the issue of US funding in Congress for the Syrian Democratic Council or for the SDF, the Syrian Democratic Forces, the armed uh, uh, militia that, um, has been allied with the United States against ISIS in Syria and now is responsible for security in your area, Dr. Ahmed. Can you tell us anything about your view, your impression, your uh, what you heard from American officials or people in Congress on this visit about US funding for your administration and for the Syrian Democratic Forces, please. And concerning the US funding, the funding will continue and the support will continue. This is what we heard from US officials in the US administration and the Congress. But because the campaign against ISIS is still ongoing, Counterterrorism does not only focus on the military side, but there is a civilian side. And we focused with the US administration on allocating a budget from the uh, civilian side from the US to eliminate the ideology of uh, Daesh, ISIS. And within this framework, we see that the US administration or at least the approach they have now is that they will continue providing support and funding to SDF and they will allocate part of the funding to the civilian side and the ideology. Okay, thank you. We have a, a question from uh, another viewer um, and 
this is Altor Suarez, who asks about the current status of your relations and discussions with the Assad regime. And related to that, uh, Hadil Ois asks whether during this visit you heard from US government officials about their views on how you should conduct your discussions or your future relations with the Assad regime. Thank you. Dr. Ahmed. What we heard is that the US administration is not against is, uh, uh, and is not opposing any dialogue that can be uh, beneficial and that uh, is in the direction of the political solution in Syria. And therefore, the dialogue with the regime will require a cooperation between the United States and Russia in this respect, because the regime was supported and is still being supported by Russia. And any dialogue has to be with cooperation from these two big players. Although the regime, we still uh, see that the regime is still uh, stubborn and they are not accepting the initiatives that are proposed for the solution. And the regime is very centralized, is insisting on the centralized governance in Syria and the regime is not accepting any form of decentralization. We still have uh, this mindset uh, in the regime. And despite that, we believe that uh, developing the dialogue with the regime is very important and we have shared our views with the US administration and they think they understand us. Related to this issue is the question of Russian policy and your relations with Russia. We have a question from David Leshner, who writes, after your visit to Moscow several weeks ago, and hearing also about Russia's meetings with high-level officials among the other players in Syria, including Israel, Jordan, Erdogan, or Turkey, and American officials, as well as with the Assad regime, can you Tell us something about your expectations regarding Russian policy and your relations with that country. Is it possible that Russia could broker agreements that would benefit Syria and Northeast Syria in particular? Well, uh, this was our demand from Russia and from Moscow to play the role of a mediator or to play the role of a guarantor for any dialogue between us and the government. In the past, there were some initiatives that were started by some officials from the Russian government, but those initiatives were not, did not bear fruits. We have uh, reiterated this uh, demand that Russia should uh, play a constructive role and to have a dialogue with the regime. And they are ready. They told us they are ready. It may not be as we demand it, but at least they have expressed their readiness to play this role, which is something very important for us. And we have requested them repeatedly to be neutral in this uh, issue. And uh, we wanted them to be mediators uh, and, and we wanted uh, to have progress with the regime. I believe in the future it is possible. We may see some new initiatives from the Russian side. David, may, may I, uh, Andrew, I please just make yes, a please. quick quick comment? It's also a question <laughs> to yes. him. Um, so, in in sort of the realm of the Russian role, as I mentioned this in my comments, we saw the administration uh, issue a license to Delta Crescent Energy, an American company, to wind <clears throat> down or to stop their operations. Um, and I believe it was extended again uh, for a few more months. Uh, my question to you is, um, at the same time, we have seen a now 
a Russian controlled company uh, called uh, Gulf Sands Petroleum, which has a block with the Chinese company Sinochem uh, and the General Petroleum Corporation of Syria. Have they made any offers to you to take over where Delta Crescent was operating previously? Or if they have not, have they made any other arrangements or have you made any other arrangements to take the place of Delta Crescent's um, activities in Northeast Syria? Well, the activities of uh, Delta Company, I think this is an internal affair. This is a U.S. affair, and until now, there is no other alternative company that applied for a license in the region, meaning that the oil in the region is being invested by the autonomous administration with very old-fashioned techniques, and the revenues are very small, and they are used to provide services to 5 million people in the area. And so far, there is no progress concerning oil and oil activities. But we do need companies to come to the region and to operate. We want them to rehabilitate the infrastructure in the region. OK, thank you. Interesting, uh, important point about the infrastructure and uh, the openness and the variety of different actors that are trying to play a role. And I appreciate that. Uh, and also your opening comment that this is an internal American issue, <laughs> uh, which leads me to, if I may, ask my own question. We still have a few more questions from the audience, and I am uh, that I am holding on to and I will get to in a few minutes and you're welcome those of you uh, tuning in to uh, send more questions my way um, we will I think have time for all of them but my question to you Dr. Ahmed if I may at this point goes back to the issue of Turkey and your own internal politics which is as you know I'm sure the Turkish government maintains that actually the administration that you lead is still part of the PKK and that your colleagues and comrades are in the Turkish government's official estimation terrorists. I don't agree with that, but I wanna ask you what steps you have taken and perhaps you could take in the future, if any, to allay those concerns that the Turkish government expresses? How can you make sure that everyone understands, even Turkey, that you and your administration and your armed forces are not the same as the PKK. Please. Here I want to highlight uh, the role of uh, PKK and uh, the role they played in the Kurdish cause. I believe that the Turkish state, uh, if they recognize the rights of the Kurdish uh, people, we would not have seen PKK. PKK emerged uh, because there are demands for the Kurdish people and there are demands for democracy in Turkey. And then this cause uh, spread or uh, spilled over to other countries that are part of the geography. But the issue you raise here, I want to highlight here that the role of uh, PKK in combating tourism is great. We have uh, seen their activities in Sinjar, in the Kurdistan uh, province, defending Kirkuk and uh, Erbil, and in Kobani, 
PKK played an instrumental role and they fought against tourism and uh, they have uh, sacrificed uh, martyrs. And until uh, today, uh, they have injured people and wounded uh, from the war. So large number of wounded uh, people are, are there on the ground from the PKK. And therefore in this area, in North and East of Syria, we have an ethical obligation or commitment uh, towards them. Uh, con but considering this uh, administration as part of uh, PKK, this is uh, very far from reality. Uh, the Syrians are those who are managing this administration. The uh, Syrians are those in charge of in the uh, political and military sides. And uh, we don't have a PKK and PKK is not represented uh, within the autonomous administration. They have uh, fought their wars uh, and we have uh, some moral obligation towards them. And the international community has to bear a responsibility here. The international community has to contribute to resolving these issues inside Turkey. This is the problem of Turkey. We, from our side, we are preparing for an elections process in north and east of Syria, and the elections will be conducted for different components and constituencies in the region. We will have Arabs, Kurds, and Turkmen's, and others, and currently we are in discussions for that, and I believe that these are very important steps and they, we will have a new administration and we will have new officials in it. Uh, for those clarifications. Um, I'm not sure, honestly, that that will satisfy the Turkish government, but uh, it's worth a try. Uh, and so I appreciate your willingness to respond to that uh, rather pointed question of mine in this forum. And now I'm going to um, turn to further questions from our audience, from our other participants all over. Uh, we have one from Jeff Selden about the humanitarian situation inside your area and the issue of ISIS, Daesh, and its activities. First of all, can you say something about the camps and in particular the needs of the children in uh, the uh, displaced persons camps under your control or in prison. Can you say something about whether or not ISIS is able to revive its recruiting and organizing and ultimately terrorist campaign using the camps or the prisons in your area? And has overall, is ISIS Daesh regaining influence in Northeast Syria and in recent months? And if so, what needs to be done about that in your view? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, in fact, uh, the camps uh, host uh, a large number of people and they are a big burden on the autonomous administration. We have large number of uh, families of ISIS fighters uh, living in these camps uh, and uh, they are uh, reproducing and uh, the uh, number of uh, the camp residents is increasing a day after another. And this is a problem. Well, the uh, medium in these camps, the mothers and the children, uh, there is uh, a fundamentalist uh, ideology there and the tourism is breeding there. And this is uh, problematic. We have raised this issue repeatedly with the international uh, partners, uh, the UN and the coalition countries. Uh, we ask them to have some mutual uh, solutions and uh, cooperation to manage these camps uh, uh, to reintegrate these children and to 
uh, hand them over to their countries uh, and the families and the women should go back to their homelands. Uh, we are working on that, uh, but uh, sadly, only uh, fractions uh, have been achieved and very small progress uh, was, was made. So only a handful of countries accepted uh, their, uh, the people of their nationalities to come back. Uh, the vast majority of uh, countries, uh, they are refusing to receive the mothers uh, and uh, children. And this is a very complicated issue and we have to work on it. We have uh, to have uh, projects for women to reintegrate and rehabilitate them. And we have large number of Iraqis uh, inside these camps. Uh, and we raised it with the UN and the coalition countries. We told them that they need to pressure the Iraqi government to take its nationals. So the progress here is very slow. And the slower the progress is, uh, the more uh, terrorism threats we see. We hear now that there are threats that the camps will be attacked in order to liberate those who are inside these camps. Uh, and uh, we have uh, seen some uh, prison strikes uh, and disobedience. And the prisons are not real uh, prisons. They are schools or buildings that were converted into prisons. Uh, and the conditions there are uh, horrific. Uh, so there must be support uh, here and we need to requalify them, reintegrate them. We have to start these programs and there should be courts actually, there should be trials for uh, the terrorists. And I believe that this is the responsibility of the coalition countries to start these programs in order to resolve this issue. We are still working on very small solutions, but they are not addressing the issue. And this is a threat to the security of the region and the world. And whenever there are Turkish threats, we see escalations uh, from ISIS and uh, we see synchronized threats from ISIS as if they are coordinating. We have uh, about 15 minutes left um, uh, by a generous estimate and if that's okay with you, Dr. Ahmed. And I am going to uh, try to run through a number of questions quickly and very much appreciate your answer. Mm -hmm. A lot of interest in all of these issues. And again, Andrew, if there's something that you wanna contribute, I'll give you a few moments at the end for any additional comments you might have, but feel free to chime in as we go along. So we have a question uh, all the way from Bahrain, from uh, an audience participant out there in the Gulf who asks about Iran and your view of Iran's policy in Syria. Do you see any changes in Iran's policy with the new government that's now in power in Tehran? Uh, in terms of their support for the Assad regime or their policy in Syria generally. And related to that, this uh, participant asks about the tremendous drop in the value of the Syrian lira or pound, the currency, and the ability of people in Syria, including in your area, to subsist, to be able to earn a living, to meet their at least minimal expenses for their families. Can you say something about, uh, please, about Iran and about the economic situation related to the decline, the sharp decline in the value of Syrian currency recently? Please. Well, Iran is uh, very strongly engaged in the Syrian file. And uh, we uh, believe that the uh, solution uh, should be a Syrian solution inside Syria. And uh, all uh, countries interfering in the uh, Syrian file, they should focus their efforts on ending the Syrian crisis and the fighting on the ground. This is uh, important. Concerning the Iranian support to the regime, well, honestly speaking, 
if we can reach a political solution with the regime, I believe that the external interventions will end uh, or uh, will wane. So the uh, solution is uh, a political solution and it should be internal Syrian uh, solution. Uh, concerning the second point, the sharp decline in the value of the Syrian uh, currency, uh, this is a very big problem and it is uh, um, resulting in soaring prices and it creates a, a massive humanitarian disaster. And uh, until now, we do not have any solution for that uh, because uh, there is no other currency that we can use in lieu of the Syrian lira. And uh, the Syrian lira is a national issue. And uh, it is a problem. It is a some, it is a difficulty that we face. I have a question about another foreign player in Syria, and that's Israel. This comes from Orinir. And the question is, do you see any role for Israel in the overall Syrian scene and in particular in your part of the country or in relations with the people under your administration how do you see israel's role in syria well, uh, basically the israeli role in the uh, syrian file it is there um, it is uh, present uh, this is a neighbor country and uh, this is a force on the syrian borders and uh, in the past uh, there were uh, some hostilities between the two sides uh, but uh, this does not deny that there are some discussions behind the scene with uh, israel uh, and therefore the Israeli role is prominent because uh, it's a country in the Middle East and it has influence. Uh, and we see that there must be a, a positive uh, policy or rapprochement with Israel in order to end the conflict inside Syria, meaning that Syria should not become a playground uh, for uh, regional uh, players to fight uh, on the uh, Syrian territory. Okay, thank you. Very, very interesting uh, question that uh, is not often posed to you, and I, I appreciate your response. That's important. I have a question uh, all the way from Bulgaria, from Nikolai Mladenov, a former senior UN official who worked in the Middle East for many years and is now actually a, an associate fellow of the Washington Institute. And he asks about your relations with the Kurdistan regional government in Iraq, another very important neighboring player and uh, something that is the subject of much speculation. Is there better cooperation lately between the Syrian Democratic Council and the Kurdistan regional government or not, please. Um, well, uh, this is a very important question concerning the relationship with the Kurdistan region. Currently, we have a crossing that we can consider as the single crossing that we have. It's a humanitarian crossing, and it is a very important one for us. There are uh, tensions currently there because of the conflicts between the Kurdish factions. So we know that those engaged with the other uh, Kurdistani parties, the uh, PKK or the Democratic Party or other uh, Kurdistani parties, some Syrian Kurds are uh, in our members of these parties and therefore the Kurdish cause is a single cause uh, for all of us uh, and it has to be resolved uh, inclusively and uh, then every uh, part uh, has its uh, unique features and therefore this diversity should be maintained. We believe that there should be a serious uh, dialogue between us and the uh, Kurdistan region government uh, to develop the uh, mutual relations uh, and we have one cause 
and they are our neighbors actually it's a neighboring region and uh, we have mutual benefits uh, and therefore there are common interests and we have to work together and we believe that uh, it is possible to uh, foster the dialogue between us uh, there are efforts here and there but they do not eliminate all the differences that we have and the turkish state uh, is uh, trying to uh, mean uh, have a drift between us a rift that i'm going to with your permission to pose to you quickly before we conclude this session. And they come from all over. Uh, the first one comes all the way from Erbil in the Kurdistan region of Iraq from Vladimir von Wilgenberg. And he asks about Turkish drones in Northeast Syria. There have been many recent new reports about increased Turkish military use of drones against Kurdish or other targets in Northeast Syria. Can you comment on that and say what can be done about that? Is there perhaps an American role in dealing with this new threat? Please. These drones uh, play a very negative role in the Kurdistan region and in North and East of Syria. Turkey is targeting individuals now using drones. And there was an agreement between Turkey and the US and Turkey and Russia in the uh, 30 kilometers uh, zone, North and North Syria. And Turkey is uh, preaching this agreement from time to time. Uh, Turkey uses drones uh, and strikes in these uh, areas recently. Nimr city was uh, attacked uh, and uh, we have casualties. Uh, uh, some members of SDF were uh, casualties uh, from the uh, Syrian uh, military council. And Turkey uses these drones to attack some civilian constructions in the area. And therefore, these drones pose a threat to the lives of civilians and Turkey has to adhere to the agreement and uh, there should be pressure in, uh, on Turkey to stop the use of these drones. Next, and almost final question comes to us about the possibility of having an election in your area and the difficulties that this faces because of the lack of success so far in reaching agreement among different Kurdish groups, among others, in Northeast Syria or neighboring areas. Can you say something and this is in response to a question from Mr. Saad Hussein in our audience about the possibility of overcoming these obstacles and holding an election. Well, uh, the uh, understanding between different Kurdish groups is very important and uh, there was a dialogue that continued for a while and then stopped after the Turkish threats uh, started in the Kurdistan region and the conflict between uh, PKK and the region. So, but we believe that it is necessary to continue this dialogue concerning the elections. But uh, it's unfair for the elections to be postponed until an agreement is reached. There are components uh, in the region. It's not only Kurds. Uh, we have the Arabs uh, and the Assyrians uh, and uh, others. And we have, we have uh, a large proportion of Arabs uh, living in the region. And therefore, it's unfair for all of them to wait until the dialogue succeeds. So we see that it is necessary for all parties to take part in these elections, there will be elections law and the elections law and the elections will be monitored by international bodies and it will have a level of democracy and everyone can participate. The parties that oppose the autonomous administration or from within the administration, people can participate and I think the elections will be a success. Important point about the issue of democracy in your area. 
And uh, the last question from the audience before I give our two great speakers a few moments for any concluding comments has to do with the specific situation right now in Raqqa. This is a question that comes to us from one of our Lebanese uh, audience members. And it, there are reports, I don't know if they're accurate or not. That is the question that in Raqqa, that the SDF has withdrawn and lowered its flag as this uh, questioner asks, and it has been replaced by Russian and Assad regime uh, flags and control over the city or perhaps over parts of the province. Can you comment on who is actually in charge of the city of Raqqa right now? Well, uh, these reports are inaccurate. Inaccurate. Uh, the Russians, yes, there are attempts to have more engagement uh, from the side of the Russian forces or the regime in these areas, but so far there is no withdrawal of our forces from that area. Factual clarification. And now we have come to the end of our allotted time, and I apologize to anyone who wasn't able to ask a question. And I'm going to ask first Andrew and then you, Dr. Ach, for any concluding brief comments that you might like to make before we end the session. Andrew, the floor is yours, please. I would just like to say um, thank you so much, um, uh, Ilham, uh, for your um, for your comments today. You you took some some. Uh, some great questions. Uh, we're, we are, uh, like you, wondering about um, uh, certain aspects of US policy, as you can tell from the questions. Uh, and we would be happy to speak with you about particularly the future of how you're going to maintain your autonomy in, in, a, in, in a way that we can eventually get to a settlement, a negotiated settlement to the war. And so thank you very much for your comments. And we look forward to the next uh, interaction. Thanks very much to you, Andrew, for being with us today and for your insightful comments and questions. And now, Dr. Ahmed, if there's anything that you would like to say in parting to our American and our international uh, audience, it turns out that many of the questions came from all over the Middle East, not just from here in the United States. The floor is yours for a couple of minutes, if you like, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, all of you. And uh, I'd like to say that we are waiting for a substantial uh, support to come from the United States. And uh, we consider these sessions as a form of support from your side to us. Uh, this is a moral uh, support to us. and. Uh, in order to eliminate tourism in the region and uh, in order to eliminate uh, despotism in the Middle East, starting from Syria, there must be a political solution. And under this framework, we are expecting American support and we are expecting the American uh, public opinion to support us and uh, to work to stop the threats and the challenges we face in the region because uh, this region represents a very important project and we are partners. We believe that we are partners with the US. And thank you. You're, you're most welcome. Thank you. It was my great privilege to host this important and very timely discussion. And with that, I'm going to bring this policy forum of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy to a close. Thanks to our speaker, Elham Ahmed, and to our excellent discussant, Andrew Tabler, my friend and colleague. I'm sure that I will see you again, both of you soon, and I hope next time in person, not just on the screen. And to our audience, thank you very much for being with us today and for all your excellent questions. And please stay with us in future occasions for more discussions of this sort here at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy in Washington, DC. For the Institute, 
This is Dr. Dave Pollock saying thank you all and goodbye.